see is, you know, the American dollar. And we think the dollar is not very powerful, you know, but it sure is over there. Uh, we're still talking about creation, evolution, two, re two religions, basically, two opinions, two philosophies. You know, the flood is it myth or truth? Dinosaurs did exist or not? Ice age, ancient or recent? Uh, evil, evolved, or sin, that's basically where we're at today. Where did bad things come from? Where does evil come from? Where does uh, suffering, death, dying, disease, where did all these things come from? Because after all, God said, when he got through with the creation in the first chapter of Genesis, in Genesis 1.31, he said it's very good. So if it's very good, how come we have all this chaos? and death and dying and disease and everything. And if it evolved, what did it evolve from? In other words, if evil, killing, corruption, murder, lying, if that's an evolved process, what did it evolve from? Something worse or something better? And if it evolved from something worse, what could be worse? You know, so. Uh, basically, uh, you face the same questions where you talk about evolution or creationism, either one. And we're going to eventually talk about race, and then we'll talk about the National Academy of Sciences and a few other subjects. Uh, that book that, that Ray has there, uh, a lot of the chapter headings are the very same headings I've used uh, in the little um, handout that you received so that uh, when we did get this book, you'll be able to see where we had been and where we're going to go. So many of the, uh, the things that we schedule, like on a certain Sunday, that title comes directly out of that book, so that you'll have a place to go right straight to. Well, uh, we talked about how old is the earth, and uh, we see that uh, we have an eternity here involved. And uh, over in the other side, there is no future. It's the death of our star and that type of thing. And so when we did discuss how old this earth was, we had these uh, different uh, proofs. We talked about many, many of them. And it boils down that we're really not sure, but the evidence, just what evidence we have in using current scientific thought process you can figure out somewhere between 7,000 and, 7, and 35,000 years. You cannot, with any type of scientific evidence or experimentation or, or scientific measurements, you cannot get an Earth older than about 35,000 years. And personally, I believe the Earth is six to 7,000 years old. Uh, then, of course, we talked about evidence for a global flood, and the evidence is everywhere. It, it's just all over the surface of the earth. It's in the mountains and the canyons. It's in the, um, the ice caps, the glaciers. It's in the oceans. It's in the continental shelf that's out underneath the uh, ocean. Uh, it's in all the volcanoes and the, the cracks in the earth, the fault lines. Everywhere you look, wave marks on mountains, seashells on the highest hills. Everywhere you look gives evidence of a global flood. And that, it is that global flood that made the coal seams, that made oil, that made things aftermath of the global flood, made the Grand Canyon, the Badlands in South Dakota, the Yellowstone National Park, Grand Canyon, Carlsbad Caverns, all these things. And uh, so we looked at uh, all of that, and in fact, stalactites give evidence of, um, of flowing water that had a lot of mineral deposits in it that was flowing for a while and then turned off. And so that uh, these stalactites and stalactites and caves were formed rather rapidly. And dinosaurs, yes, they lived with us during mankind, or else how could man have drawn these pictures and uh, carved drawings on walls of caves and walls of canyons such as this one that was drawn in White River Canyon in Utah. And so it's evident that 
men and dinosaurs did live together or else man could not have drawn one. You say, well, uh, maybe it's a recent drawing or etching. No, with good known scientific data, uh, they know that these things are several thousand years old, not millions, not hundreds of millions or anything like that. And of course, we talked about the Ice Age. Was Is it a ancient earth forming technique of uh, 20 different times of having ice ages or was it a one time occurrence that lasted less than a thousand years after the flood that we're still in the last remnants of in that we have these north and south pole uh, polar caps and the glaciers still hanging high in some of the mountains and uh, this uh, post flood and uh, the, I think we presented information that it's post-flood because to make an ice age, you must have a sudden cooling of the land and with uh, lots of warm water. Warm water being dehydrated, being pulled up in the atmosphere, being pulled toward the poles. And since you have this cold land mass, it falls out over the land, freezes very rapidly, becomes ice and buries things. We even talked about the uh, Army Air Corps P-38 aircraft that's been recovered from the ice cap in Greenland and from almost 300 feet of ice, solid ice, not snow, to solid ice. In fact, that ice, some of it in some places is packed down so hard, it actually took and flattened B-17s down to just uh, couple of feet high, you know, just flattened them right down, just took them right down to the solid metal. But this particular P-38, uh, the ice did not put the weight on it, it just encased it, and so they've recovered it, and they have it over at the airport at Millsboro, and it will be flying pretty soon. They have uh, totally uh, restoring that thing. And so the ice age is not something that's uh, dem demonstrable 20 different times because you can't form an ice age by having a slow cool down. You need large amounts of uh, water vapor from a warm water source and you need cold land masses and you would have gotten that right after the flood with all the uh, volcanization, volcano exploding and the earth cracking and breaking and the geysers of water and everything coming up and the chaos and everything you have all this warm water coming up from inside the earth and then you would have all this debris and everything occluding the sun and causing the land masses to cool down and so you would set up the just exact correct criteria to get an ice age. You cannot get an ice age any other way. And um, of course uh, evolution says that uh, this happened 2 million, 11 million years ago with periods, interglacial periods, happened 20 different times. Creation says this happened soon after the flood lasted less than a thousand years. And uh, so we went to the um, biblical flood, caused the ice age, warm oceans, cold land, polar hurricanes, quick accumulation of ice, slow cool down will not generate an ice age. And so this brings us uh, to the point that uh, uh, where are we headed? Well, the secular thought process is our sun will dim and all life forms will cease. And uh, the Christian view, of course, and we're given that in 2 Peter 3, 10 and 13, is the day of the Lord will come and that the elements will melt with fervent heat. In other words, the very elements himself, iron, copper, uh, oxygen, lithium, uh, hydrogen, all the different elements will melt with fervent heat. And we know the way you can get this to happen is to release all the protons in the center of the atom to let them fall apart, not hold them together anymore, all those positive charges. So the power that holds them together will release that power. And right now we experiment with that and play with it. Remember, we just release a little tiny bit of uh, that uh, nucleus of an atom and we can create a, a nuclear bomb or a thermonuclear device with a great tremendous amounts of heat and destructive force. Well, can you imagine with all the atoms falling apart at the same time, how much heat would be generated and how much noise would be generated? And that's exactly what this passage in Second Peter says, that with a great noise, 
and the elements melting with fervent heat, the heavens and the earth will pass away. And we're looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth. Well, that brings us to today. Bad things. Just where in the world did bad things come from? Death, disease, suffering, the chaos. In human beings, the sorrow, the tears, the suffering. Um, just bad things. Because God said that he created it, it was good the first day. He created it, it was good the second day. And he gets right on down to the sixth day. And he finally winds up creating mankind, Adam and Eve. And then he said it's very good. And then he shut creation off. And uh, then he showed us uh, a day of rest. He didn't have to rest because he didn't get tired. God does not get tired. God did not need to rest. Um, God simply did that as a model. God models things. We are in his image. We are eternal. We'll never cease to exist. But we have a beginning but no ending. We are eternal. God has no beginning and no ending. He is eternal. God makes choices. But God controls the consequences of his choices. We are made in his image. We have the freedom to make choices, but we cannot control the consequences of our choices. God controls the consequences. And so God is the power. He has all the power. There's no power anywhere that's not God's power. He gives power, grants power to certain people or countries or nations and things of that nature. But God controls all the power. And God also is all the knowledge. He is total knowledge. There's not anything that God does not know. And he's everywhere all the time at the same time. In other words, there's, you, there, you can't go somewhere where God's not already is. He's there. He's here. He's there at the same time. And he's totally righteous and holy. He makes no mistakes. He does no evil. Uh, you know, some people say, well, you can't limit God. In other words, I, I'm, it's not, I'm not limiting God. God limits himself. God cannot lie. You say, oh, but you're limiting God. No, I'm not. I'm simply describing God. And something that we look at, we think maybe God has made a mistake. We're making that opinion out of a finite, fallen mind. In other words, who am I as a finite, limited person that is in a fallen position but redeemed, how can I make decisions about an infinite God? I cannot. So there's many things we just have to accept. And by accepting it, we manifest our faith. And so we're going to try to arrive today. Where did uh, evil come from? Why do bad things happen and all that? And right off the bat, you have to say, well, God is in total control. But God did not create evil, but God allowed evil. It says very clearly that Satan is the father of sin. And he's the first sinner. You know, Adam was the first of mankind, Adam and Eve, first mankind to sin. But the first sin occurred in heaven, and it occurred uh, as an act of volitional act of Satan. Satan had his free will also. Satan is also created eternal. You, sometimes we say, well, if Satan got in there and tempted Adam and Eve, and he's so destructive, and he's, he came to kill, steal, and destroy. That's right in the scripture, too. There's a verse that tells you exactly what Satan's here for, to kill, steal, and destroy. And why didn't God just destroy him? Same reason God will not destroy you or me. He will not annihilate us. Because God created us eternal. And God's not going to go back on his word because God is absolutely um, honest, true, pure, holy, righteous, and he's not going to violate his own word. Same token, he's not going to annihilate or destroy Satan because he made Satan eternal. Now, he has reserved a place for Satan called the lake of fire in outer darkness. And he's also destined that that's where the false prophet and the beast will go and the fallen angels that's what it was made for this place was not made for men mankind 
It was made for angels, fallen angels, the prophet, false prophet, and the uh, you know the false priest, the antichrist, and all that. However, we are here to make one choice. We're here to make a choice where we will spend eternity. And there's only two places. You can either spend eternity with the Lord or without the Lord. Now, since the Lord is everywhere all the time at the same time, where can you go as a unredeemed human being? Where can you go that God's not at? Well, you can only go to that one special place where he's going to choose not to allow his presence to be known. Now, whether he will be there or not, I don't know. But he's not going to allow his presence to be known. And they're not going to sense or know that they're in the presence of God if he were there. But my, my opinion, strictly my opinion, coming from a finite mind, is that God will choose not to be there and he will remove himself from that area, that lake of fire, that outer darkness. And so... When all the unbelievers of all time come before the great white throne of judgment and they look to be judged and their name's not in the Lamb's book of life so they can't be judged by the judgment seat of Christ. So they have to come before the great white throne of judgment before God, their creator. And they'll be judged according to their works. And no one can do sufficient works, the scripture tells us. All works are as filthy rags. So therefore no one can qualify to become in the presence of God by works. No one can. So that throws out entire worldwide religions, such as Catholicism. Totally throws out Catholicism theology. Uh, you know, there's, there's little things like this that when you get it right from the scripture will throw out entire world religions, such as Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, Islam, Shinto, Buddha, there's, there's things that God has shared with us that throws them out. A lot of people accuse us Christians of being smug and narrow-minded to think that we, we claim we have the only way to heaven. No, we do not claim that. It just so happens to be the only way, and I just so happen to believe it and desire to get there that way. And uh, Islam and Buddhism and Shintoism all are not just restricted to certain areas of the world today. They're building Islamic uh, mosques left and right all through the United States now. And you want to see one of the big ones, you just come south out of Dayton, headed towards Cincinnati and look to your right, and you'll see a gigantic Muslim mosque, mosque there. And that's not the only one in the United States. Detroit's covered up with them and so is many other places. But anyway, uh, these bad things now, God has permitted to occur because he made us in his image to have free choice. Or else we wouldn't be in God's image. God has choice. He made us eternal to be in his image. He made us with choice to be in his image. He made us capable of forgiving to be in his image. He made us capable of loving to be in his image. He made us capable of doing all kinds of creative acts. But we cannot start with nothing and get something. We have to start with something to create something that never existed before. You know what that is? That's our children. See, that just totally destroys reincarnation. Any religion that has reincarnation is just destroyed right there. Because God made us in his image. He creates something from nothing. A male and a female in the bond of marriage through a sexual relationship can take a one cell from each one of their bodies which is not an individual not an individual neither one of these are eternal neither one of these have an existence but you put the two of them together and guess what the husband and the wife just created a new living individual that will never cease to exist never cease to exist. You were brought eternal beings into existence that never existed before. Totally destroys Mormonism. Mormonism believes that uh, the God is up there and he's having celestial sex with his celestial wives making little celestial souls and then when men and women on earth get together and, and, and uh, have a child and uh, this, this Mormon God sends this, this little Mormon soul down there to occupy this, uh, this body that's been formed of this union or relationship. And so what happens is Jesus Christ 
according to Mormon theology, is the most successful of all the human beings. He's on his way to becoming a god. And he will take his wives, Mary Magdalene, Mary Margaret, and all those people, and uh, they will get their, their heaven somewhere, and they'll have their celestial sex, and they'll have their celestial little beings, and they'll send them down to occupy the celestial, these people, these secular people. Now that's Mormon theology. Where Mormons will admit it to you or not, it's in their books of theology and right in their book of Mormon and everything. And the devil is the most unsuccessful human being. The devil and, and Jesus are brothers, according to Mormon theology. Well, you can see when God said that he made us in his image, look how many things that destroyed, world-class religions. Well, it didn't destroy them. They, they came up in spite of the truth. See, Mormonism came up in spite of the truth. Jehovah Witnessism came up in spite of the truth. Islam came up in spite of the truth. And if us Christians are not careful, we'll come up in spite of the truth and we'll no longer be Christians. We'll call ourselves Christians, but we'll not really be Christians. We'll be Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and all that kind of thing. And we'll think more of that theology than we will of God's principles from his scripture. We have to be very careful. We can go the route of these other false religions and cults. Us Baptists can become a cult group overnight if we're not careful, you know. And so the scripture's where it's at. It's knowing the principles of scripture. It's knowing where, uh, understanding the principles. You know, right off the, you know why people don't like the first 11 chapters of Genesis? You know why liberals don't like them? Because liberals can't embrace homosexuality if they believe in the first 11 chapters. They can't believe in divorce and all the things of, of the new uh, social correctness and everything, political correctness. They can't buy into all that in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. You can't buy into abortion if you believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis. See, if you want to be politically correct, you've got to become uh, liberal in your theology, and you have to become a theistic evolutionist, and you have to throw out the first 11 chapters of Genesis as being based on some kind of Babylonian flood epic myth. When it's the other way around. The Babylonian flood epic is based, it's a distortion of the flood story. It's the other way around. See, the flood came first, not Babylon, not the Babylonian epic. Hammurabi's code, you know, is, is actually a wording or a paraphrase of God's uh, commands as to how he commanded man to live his life. Hammurabi's uh, legal code uh, is an old, old code, but it's based upon, really, if you look at it, you think he's reading the Ten Commandments. What you think? Well... These bad things such as death and disease and suffering and all that, that was not in the original plan when God designed it. In other words, God did not design in death, dying, and suffering. There, now, you have to be careful how you handle some of this information or you wind up being an evolutionist without knowing it. And it, it's, 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 it's funny how this happens sometimes. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. Uh, but we want to see something about where this stuff comes from. Well, the secular view, of course, would be that, hey, since there's evolution involved, everything is by random natural selection. And it comes from chaos. I mean, you know, you've got a bubbling ocean, volcanic action, and lightning, and high radiation, and you spark and get a little, one little sail, and that little sail somewhere there has to survive chaos and everything, finally come multicellular animals and plants, and they're all competing for their niche in the ecological area, you know. And, uh, you know, they have to defend themselves. They have to kill. They have to rise to the top. It's survival of the fittest, random chance, or, you know, and death and suffering and meat eating. I mean, you know, how many, how many times have you on a movie or in a program you've seen these dinosaurs just ripping everybody else apart and ripping each other apart, you know. And uh, it's an evolved process. And in fact, you know, man, if you ever, ever saw any of these uh, movies about prehistoric man, you know, he's grunting and everything. He, he discovered uh, uh, fire accidentally, and he discovered a wheel accidentally, and he discovered everything accidentally. He used to, he used to fight with, uh, you know, with their hands and claws, and then somebody picked up a rock and hit somebody and found out, hey, it killed them much quicker, and so now they become combatant, you know. They build up this chaotic warfare, killing 
and meat eating came from you know some animal they killed some animal and it fell over it burned in a forest fire and it smelled pretty good and they tasted of it and then they learned to cook meat see I mean everything's supposed to have happened accidentally accidentally out of chaos and all that well we have talked about the Christian view uh, it's a created very good Genesis 131 no death no disease no suffering no meat eating in fact, meat eating did not come until after the flood. Everybody were still vegetarians after the fall. They were supposed to be, let's put it that way. Now where somebody killed an animal and ate it before the flood, it was not authorized by God. If they did it, they were violating God's decrees. And uh, not only that, maybe that was part of why God destroyed the earth. Maybe their violations, not just for eating the meat, but killing the animals. They were not authorized to kill animals except for sacrifice or something of that nature. And uh, so, everything is very good. No death. Death came at the fall. No disease, because uh, disease is a death and dying process. No suffering, because if you have no death and have no disease, and you don't have to work for your food, and the weather's perfect, you know, and, and Adam and Eve had perfect neighbors, right? Didn't have any delinquent children or anything. Everything in the garden was perfect. There was no reason in the world for them to fall except for one. Choice. That's all. Free choice. God didn't have us out there on puppet strings. He gave us free choice. And that's the only reason in the world they had to fall. They, had, they didn't have a uh, bad environment. They didn't have uh, chaos or suffering. They didn't have to worry about animals uh, stalking them. They didn't have to worry about bad neighbors. They have to worry about slums. They didn't have to worry about anything. Everything was perfect. Can you imagine just having a perfect environment all the time? And the sunlight, beautiful every day. And probably no clouds. And there might have been a little, little bit, I think. But there's no rain, so there couldn't have been very many clouds of any kind. And no high winds, just a breeze in the cool of the day, you know, just a slight breeze. No rains, no floods, no hurricanes, tornadoes, none of that. No meat eating, no hunting, just pick your food off the tree in the bushes. And uh, at that time, they had perfect bodies. Vegetarian diet was of no problem, is all in balance and everything. And you see trees and fruit and the soil and everything there, they were different before the fall, and they were sure different before the flood. So you can't forget those two great chaoses, the fall and the flood. Those things have had astounding effects on us and the creation, and we'll talk about it here in a moment. So, that's the way it was. That's the Christian view. Now, the Bible, we just went through some of this, tells us that we were... All vegetarians, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. In 131, when he finished that, after making us all vegetarians, animals and man both, said it was very good. And the thing about it, if you look in this passage, if you look in the Hebrew, uh, man and animals, certain animals are called living creatures. In Genesis 2, 7, Adam is referred to as a living uh, creature. In other words, a nefesh chayah in the Hebrew. And the fesh is that word that's uh, basically like a spirit or a soul. And this is the word for living. And it, incidentally, this chiyah or hayah is also the word that uh, God used at the burning bush when Moses asked him, said, uh, who shall I say sent me? He says, you tell them that I am that I am, or I am which I am, or I am that I am, because that word I shear in there can be which or what or that. So it's I am that I am, I am which I am, I am what I am. But I am Hayah here, a Chia, uh, two ways to pronounce it. Uh, this, this is the, the I am type thing, and, and like this is sort of like I am soul, I am spirit. Now certain animals are referred to as having a nefesh, a spirit, a soul, but not eternal. But that is interesting because plants are not referred to as having an nefesh. Plant, so, you see, 
In the garden, when and Adam and Eve would eat a banana or grapes, that was not killing the grape or killing the banana. There was no life in it. See? And it's something interesting. Leaves didn't fall off the tree in the garden. I'm almost sure of that. Fruit didn't fall off and rot. Fruit was just there. If you picked one off, another one just came back in its place. And it stayed there until you picked it and ate it. It didn't ruin. There's no death or dying process. See, we, it's hard for us to think of that. No death or dying process. It would take us a good hour probably to explain this work. You know, here's the garden of Eden, go work and till it. Well, that's a King James translation. And, you know, the king back in those days in the English couldn't imagine somebody just laying around a garden enjoying themselves eating for pleasure all the time. Thought that'd send the wrong message to the people. And so they chose to take this alternate view on this work and rest thing in, from the Hebrew to the English. But really, uh, they were to go in the garden to worship. You know, they were to worship in the garden. That's the purpose for, the, for it. Because after all, it says that's where God came to walk with them. He didn't come uh, to supervise their work. He came to uh, worship with them, to meet with them. Face-to-face -face relationship. That's the way we're going to have it again someday, see. And anyway, uh, vegetarians, very good, living cre creatures here. This, uh, this nefesh, chaya, plants, no nefesh. No nefesh. See, in the English, it will just talk about uh, the body or the living or something like that. Well, this nefesh, chaya, living creature. Leviticus 17.11 says life is in the blood. And uh, it, we have something interesting going on in Genesis 2.19. Adam gave uh, certain animals names, such as the cattle, the birds of the air, animals of the field. But the creeping things he did not name. And so there's some kind of distinction made between certain animals also. And uh, there's uh, no violent death amongst the animals at this time, regardless of what category they fall in. Now let's look at post-flood though. The ark has rested. Noah and his family have left the ark, built the altar, the rainbows in the sky, and he's told them that now there will be weather phenomena, there will be seasons, there will be harvest time, winter, summer. Uh, he tells them that the, uh, that the animals now are available for food. They can become meat eaters, and animals can eat animals, and man can eat animals. And if this is the first point where animals are afraid of man and afraid of each other, Genesis 9-2. Before that, there's no problem. People said, how in the world did Noah get all these wild animals aboard the ark? They were not wild. They were as tame as they could be. And uh, so... There's no problem with Noah getting the animals. In fact, it said God brought the animals to the ark, if you read it carefully. So God just had these animals just start coming into the vicinity of the ark, and so they put them on there. But uh, post-flood meat eating, and we'll get that in Genesis 9-3, where the uh, animals now available for food. As to why, lots of speculation. We've lost the water canopy, things have changed. It's obvious that God has changed man. Uh, man was changed after the fall in the garden. Uh, God changed the earth. God changed animals. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. And so there's been some change take place. That's the reason why we can't take today and apply it to the past. We can't take today and apply it pre-flood or pre-fall. We can't take our bodies and apply them to pre-fall or pre-flood. Because we can't live to be 800 years old. And even before the fall, there was no such thing as death. So there was no aging process until probably the flood, uh, the aging process. See, everything you read in the Bible about these guys are six, seven, eight hundred years old. There's no reference made to them being of diminished uh, health or diminished anything. They just said they lived that many years and they died. And what is dying? James 2.26. The absence of the spirit, the body is dead. So after 800 years, God told the Spirit, 
of somebody to leave his body and his body was dead but his spirit was withdrawn. And then we find though after the flood, man's life expectancy is cut in half every generation after the flood. Until you get up to the time of Abraham and we're down now to 120 to 180 years. And uh, it just kept getting less and less and less. During the Middle Ages when everything was so corrupt and so much disease and pestilence was going around, the average life expectancy of a man was about 38 years old. It was rare for somebody to know in person their grandparents. In other words, their grandparents would have already died before they got old enough to know their grandparents. And that was because of disease and all that. Now that we've had all these uh, sanitation and hygiene and drugs and medications and learned a few things, we now can struggle up to 60, 70, or 80 years of age only with great attempts at taking care of our diet and exercise, watching our blood pressure and medication. Some people just seem to have the genes for it, though. They're going to break 100 regardless of what they do. You know, they just got that in their genes. That's a remnant from why we used to be to have these very strong, dynamic genes. Well, and then we had this fear take place here. And you see, fear is a protective device. In other words, it's a defense device. Where did that come from? Well... God, right in the scripture, it says that God now would make the animals afraid of man. So this defense mechanism right here was designed by God and given to the animals after the flood. So it means that God stepped back in and redesigned animals. And the way he did that is he had to pattern their... Uh, their uh, or DNA so that they would just do things. In other words, animals just do things because they're designed that way. Why in the world does a spider make a web of a certain shape and certain size in a certain location? Because that spider knows how to make that web and he knows where to make it to catch his prey so he can stay alive. And the prey he's going to catch in there, he's going to run down in the web and he's going to tie him up in more webbing and he's going to inject him with something to paralyze him but not kill him. So he'll be preserved meat for a later meal. You know, you see these wasps running around uh, catching spiders? Well, if you take them back to the wasp nest, they paralyze that spider and they put it in the nest with the eggs they lay so that when their little pupa hatch out, they'll have something to eat on until they can survive enough to come out of that little old uh, sail there in that wasp nest. Wasp nest is a very interesting thing. And you break a wasp nest down somewhere, you're going to spray it with your raid, you know, and if you break it apart, and you'll see all those spiders in there. And some of them still sort of wiggling their legs a little bit. They've been paralyzed. They're still alive. And these little things that hatch out, they know not to eat the vital part of the spider first. They start eating its legs off and a few other things. And they save for the very last thing, eating the part that will kill the spider. Well, it's hard to imagine evolution. But that is definitely an attacking, hurting, trapping, killing, eating mechanism. And uh, God stepped in. When he now makes anim animals afraid of man, he had to because man's going to hunt them to extinction. We've hunted many animals to extinction and God knew we'd do that. And anyway... He gave them these defense mechanisms, how they defend themselves against each other. Why the bombardier beetle, could, like a double barrel shotgun, can shoot these shots at you, you know. And uh, they got a, a fish, the archer fish, under the water. He gets him a mouthful of water and he spots an insect up on a branch. and He'll ease up to the surface and he'll shoot that mouthful of water and knock that insect off into the water. And, I mean, these, these guys do this because that's what their DNA tells them to do. When mama bird goes in the nest and uh, certain birds will peck a red spot on the uh, bird's beak, certain birds. And then that, that mama bird, when that, that red spot is pecked, she automatically just throws up, regurgitates what she's swallowed so the birds can feed. Now some of them actually bring the live insects and worms into the nest and the mouths are open. How does mama bird know which one of those has been fed? You know, she'll feed them all pretty equally. It's all been imprinted. How does a goose know 
all of a sudden one morning just gets up in the air and flies around the pond a little bit and a whole bunch of them rise into the air and everything they head north and they head up through a flyaway and they come right on up and they go up into Canada and Alaska and they go to a certain spot and they lay their eggs they raise their young and a certain time in the fall all of a sudden they were flying around back and forth but a certain morning they rise up above the water and they'll circulate a little bit and off they come south again and how do they know that? The hummingbird goes all the way to Mexico and South America. The monarch butterfly goes to a particular tree in a particular country in Central America. You go down there and you find a monarch butterfly tree and the whole tree has hundreds of thousands of monarchs hanging on it. They fly across the Gulf of Mexico. That's unbelievable. A monarch butterfly. A monarch butterfly all these other butterflies usually die. These swallowtails, yellow ones and all that, and blue ones. Not a monarch. A monarch migrates. How in the world does a monarch butterfly know how to migrate where to go to? How does that young goose, I guess you say, well, he just follows the flock. It may be. But he knows where to go back, back and forth. You know, somebody had to be the original one to mark off the trail, right? Everybody can't follow the flock. Somebody has to know something. It's imprinted. And uh, we're not made that way. We have choice. We're not imprinted. Animals do as animals do because they're imprinted. That's the reason why you cannot trust a bear. I don't care how tame it is, you cannot trust a bear. Have you all seen those photos they captured on family videos? The lady offering the bear something to eat and then she ran out of food and the bear associates what? Her hand is where the food came from. So he just bit her hand off, and right on the video camera. And uh, you know, you stand there, you see a woman looking down. She has no hand. You know, that bear did. Ex I mean, it wasn't a mean bear. That bear did what he's been designed to do: to attack, hurt, trap, kill, eat. But this only came after the flood. Now, the point is, you know, about these designs. Where in the world did they come from? How did they come? You notice, sort of leave an evolution out of this. What we're really working on is, as Christians, view one. These structures had other functions prior to, prior to the, uh, the fall or the flood. And they degenerated after the flood uh, because of the effects of ultraviolet, radia ultraviolet radiation. And because there's no water canopy now to protect them. But you see, the problem with this is, is just like evolution. If, if they had another use and it modified after the flood, after we lost the water canopy because of ultraviolet radiation, you're talking about mutations. And mutations have, have to happen very quickly, very rapidly to bring on millions and millions and millions of changes. And uh, it just doesn't seem possible that uh, these structures were there had some of their function, like these fangs and, and things that animals have and all that. We talked about the panda bear having those big teeth and big claws, but it's deep bamboo shoots with. Uh, the problem, uh, you have to use evolutionary techniques of mutation and natural selection. And then what do they eat in the meantime while they're evolving this? In other words, while they're mutating, what did they eat in the meantime? We're post-flood. We don't have a lot of vegetation around. You see, don't have a lot of animals around either. There had to have been a tremendous, tremendous upsurge in um, numbers of uh, plants and animals right after the flood. Well, programmed instincts. The spider and the web we talked about. Migratory birds, snakes. Why in the world? I mean, you know, after the flood, some snakes wound up with a central nervous system venom, which attacks your central nervous system, shuts your breathing down, everything else. And other snakes wound up with a venom that attacks your clotting mechanism. If you get bitten by those snakes, you'll bleed to death internally. Now, where did this come from? In other words, it couldn't have just been there already, and there were fangs of a rattlesnake. Uh, the DNA was already there, and then uh, when the flood occurred and water canopy gone the DNA was already there for it didn't manifest itself until it was uh, hit by ultraviolet radiation these are some of the theories 
There's another one, view two, designed by the Creator. None prior to fall. He didn't design any of this before the fall. So after the fall, or the flood, he uh, had to come along and create all new creation that all the animals and plants we have today didn't exist before the fall. All totally different set. Well, that doesn't make sense in accordance with Scripture. So you have to throw that one out. And they were present in latent, massed form. In other words, they were there, but the fangs weren't used for uh, uh, striking other animals or people with, and the venom was not for the purpose of uh, killing or gathering food. And that one uh, doesn't uh, seem to be too acceptable neither. But the redesign of existing creatures. Now that's the one that I feel has the, the, the most credence. In other words, uh, most believable. Because God designed us, he created us. And you know, we went through a redesign at the fall. And we don't even think about that. You know that? We, we don't we read through that part in Genesis chapter 1 so fast we think we understand it. And what happened was, you remember Genesis 3? There was a curse put on mankind. And the curse was that he would die. He would suffer. There would be pain. That's a redesign. God probably redesigned our DNA or added some DNA. Now God can certainly do that. There's no problem. He's got Adam and Eve, the two originals. And so all he has to do is modify those two. And everybody after that will be that way. Well, that makes sense because we're all like Adam and Eve. And God said that's the way it was going to be. That we're all fallen because Adam and Eve has fallen. But also a curse on the animals. And that curse on the animals is going to remain and uh, until there's a new creation. And uh, curse on the earth. Thorns, thistles will come up, choke out things. And uh, so the earth is cursed. The plants have been redesigned. Look at that. Man, animals, and plants were redesigned after the fall. And certainly after the flood. We've gone through redesign. Well, that's not so far-fetched. What are we talking about doing right now? Designer children, right? Getting the DNA from parents and modifying it. And so we can give the parents that exact child they want, the exact sex, male or female, the exact type to be to be a football player, to be an intellectual, you know. We're going to design people. That's one of the goals. See, Hitler had that ideal by genetics. But now we're talking about doing it by DNA, which is basically genetics also. But a redesign. And the above represent, and it's right here in the scripture, how they were redesigned. And so again, you get over to the flood, and you're talking redesign again. You're talking about the DNA being modified in animals so that they would now seek out certain other animals to kill and eat. And everybody would have their own particular food source because it couldn't just be killing everybody and everything. And see, you can't evolve that. God had to design that. So God designed it to control the populations so everybody have food to eat and could survive and still have the animals to exist. So I, I accept redesign by God. That's where I think it came from. And I look to these passages right here showing where God redesigned man and plants and animals after the fall. And then I look at the flood and I say, there was more redesign that took place. Now this would have been the sovereign directive. In other words, as a result of Adam's sin. You know Romans 8 just talks about how all creation is fallen. You know it's just, uh, it's, uh, it's the whole thing is just uh, fallen. And it's uh, subject to the curse. And uh, the curse was a redesign. Now, we're going to get redesigned again. Do you know that? Redesigned. We were designed. Psalms 139 tells us that. Uh, uh, the book of um, uh, Jeremiah tells us that. Uh, many places we're told that God knew us while we were in the womb, before we were in the womb, and all that kind of thing. So, God designed us. Then, as a result of the fall, God redesigned us in a fallen state. 
At the end of the flood or during the flood, God redesigned again the plants and the animals and mankind. And so that's what we have today. We're in that second redesigned stage. We're going to get redesigned again. And it's called uh, glorified body. And in the glorified body, we're going to get rid of pain, tears, sorrow, death, dying, disease, and all that. And not only that, the animals are going to go through a redesign. And so this is our restoration process. And uh, so we're finite creatures. And we're finding out we cannot argue from the present to the past. In other words, we can't take things the way they are today and say that's the way they were before the flood. That's the way they were before the fall. We can't do that. We, we can't age the earth. We can't do any of that. We have to realize that the scripture gives a very good report on what God has done. He doesn't tell us everything, but he tells us all we need to know. Because he doesn't want to tell everything because in John, the last chapter, it says the world would not hold the books if everything was written about what he has done. Well, it's clear that survival of the fittest Killing, etc., had no place in the original creation, nor in the restoration that we're facing in the future. Now, in the future, we're told, I believe in Isaiah, I'm trying to remember the passage, I might have referred to it on one of the overheads here. It says that the lamb and the lion and the snake and the child will all lay down together, play together and that type of thing. Some people see that as millennial language. I, I see it as millennial language. Some people see it as the new heaven and new earth language, and these would be people holding to a, to a um, ah-mill view, whereas I hold to a uh, pre-mill view. And uh, so I believe in a literal uh, millennium, and that's where I believe all this happened. And God is going to show us for a thousand years what it could have been like. And there, there'll be no aging, there'll be no dying, there'll be no tears, no sorrow, none of that. We'll all be vegetarians again, and all the animals will no longer be afraid of man, and they will not hurt each other or hurt mankind. So we're going to go through a redesign. So if you're trying to figure out what this thing of the glorified body is, that's when God's going to redesign us. And I know that sounds rather brutalish and, and scientific, but... You know, what do we mean when we say we get a glorified body? You know, we have been uh, justified by the blood of Christ. We are being sanctified to the mind of Christ. And that we're, uh, now that we have through our justification, we have established a relationship with the Lord. We are now working out our salvation in sanctification so that we have fellowship with the Lord. And then when we leave this body and get our glorified body, then we'll, that would be our row of glorification. And uh, that's when we actually enter in to this new heaven, new earth, and the eternity in the presence of God. Whereas all those that have not been redeemed, they will not get a redesigned body. And they will be in the lake of fire forever in outer darkness, suspended so far away from the presence of God as far as they're concerned that there's no light whatsoever. You see, it says there's no need for, for a light in the new heaven and new earth, new Jerusalem. Well, the same token, see, the outer darkness, there is no light because it says in the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem that, that the Lord is the light. Well, the Lord's going to choose not to be in the lake of fire area. So he's absent. So there's absolutely no light. I mean, absolutely no light. Darkness will be so thick as it will seem like one is suspended in darkness. There's no hierarchy in the lake of fire. There's nobody in charge. There's no levels or anything. I think the suffering that's going to come places that you're trapped for eternity with all of your thoughts. You will have, you will have absolute remembrance of everything you've done. And remembrance, you'll be told also, you'll be informed. You will know, you will be imprinted evidently in such a way, maybe that is the redesign of the unbeliever, that they will know the effects of everything they've done. See, that will happen to us, and we'll have tremendous tears and sorrow and all that, and then that will all be wiped away. And this is the judgment seat of Christ where that happens to us, but it does not affect our eternal state. 
it affects only our accountability because God says we have to account for even every idle word that we have said. Well, we've arrived at the same place where that uh, we've arrived before. This is what I was just talking about. There it is, Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. That's about the wolves and leopards and children and all that dwelling together peaceably. And uh, Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. And the option, you've seen this before, remove those preconceived evolutionary process ideals, remove millions and billions of years, take the Bible seriously, and you will find your answer to what happened and when it happened and how it happened and all those other questions that you have if you'll just put your faith in the Bible and the Bible truth. And taken from evolutionary thought process, if you think about something long enough, it's just bound to have occurred. And of course, we beat them to it. God did Psalms 119, 11. By word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So God already had it there before the evolutionists even borrowed it.